Yeah. Okay. All right. I think we're all set. All right. Thank you, Victor, and uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to uh, attend this talk. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, this uh, very intensely uh, researched topic uh, these days in signal processing, communications, and radar communities. Uh, that is integrated sensing and communications, or ISAC, which is the term communication society uses. Uh, another term for this is joint radar communications. It is very difficult to summarize the entire gamut of problems in this area in this roughly 50 minute lecture. So my goal here is to give you an overview uh, of the state of the art uh, and a historical context first uh, about this topic, and then uh, pick some examples of joint radar communications uh, for different applications. And as we progress in this talk, uh, we'll also go from a very theoretical example to a very practical one, just so that uh, I uh, give an impression uh, uh, that this problem is researched uh, uh, in all of its aspects, not just uh, uh, in hardware, but there are many interesting theoretical challenges as well. So uh, Victor already mentioned about me. I'm not going to read everything here. Uh, I just want to highlight that uh, apart from my role at ARL in Maryland, uh, I'm also technical advisor of these two very promising startups. The first is uh, Hertzwell, which is Asia's first automotive radar startup based in Singapore. Uh, I have been associated with them right from uh, their inception in 2018. And the second is uh, Aura Intelligence Systems, which is a 5G imaging radar startup based in Boston that is use of 5G waveforms for sensing and imaging, very much related to what we are going to discuss today. My primary research interest is in radar and I explore its connections with signal processing, remote sensing, electromagnetics and communications. I would like to acknowledge a number of my colleagues uh, whose collaborative re uh, re uh, research with me will feature in this talk from RB Research Lab, University of Luxembourg, Industrial University of Santander in Colombia, as well as DEFCOM ARL and uh, Washington DC based US National Academies for funding most of this research. In my talk, I like to put snippets from my favorite science fiction TV shows and movies where the characters are discussing radar. That is just to keep things interesting. And you will see that throughout this talk, uh, it may or may not be related with joint radar communications, but definitely related to radar. However, the uh, snippet that you see on this particular slide is very much uh, uh, relevant to the problem I'm going to discuss today. This scene is from a very popular Apple TV Plus show for all mankind, which is about a bunch of NASA scientists, and it is set in 1960s, uh, an alternative fictional historical timeline. In this scene, these scientists are discussing the effect of solar flares in early 1960s because of heightened sunspot activities on communications networks. Apparently, these solar flares uh, could jam the communications. There were quite a few instances in early 1960s about this. If you go back to 1960s and look into the IEEE or other technical literature, there used to be a journal called IEEE Transactions on RF Interference. It has been discontinued for a while. And most of the papers that were published around this time in this journal, they were about this problem. That is the effect of solar flares on ground-based electronics and so on. This is a, a very good example of natural interference. Uh, uh, today, we are going to discuss man-made interference. That is interference from uh, emitters such as radar, navigation systems, or positioning or timing systems on communications, and vice versa, and how to mitigate that interference. So clearly, there has been a lot of work on RF interference studies right from 1960s. As far as joint radar communications is concerned, we can trace uh, it back to, again, early 1960s, a very preliminary rudimentary paper appeared around 1962 in one of the IEEE journals. Then there was some work by NASA in late 1970s about sharing of spectrum by multifunctional systems like radar and communication so that they don't cause interference to each other. 
However, it was really in the mid 1980s that this problem uh, uh, actually gained uh, more salience because in 1980s, US Army was trying to deploy uh, this one particular radar system that we call FOPEN radar or foliage penetration radar. It operates in UHF, VHF band. Uh, and throughout 1960s and 70s, because of proliferation of TV and broadcast stations, when Army tried to deploy this radar, it started encountering a lot of interference from TV and broadcast stations, which also operate in that same band. Since the transmit signal bandwidth of open radar is extremely wide, uh, engineers came up with a very simple solution. Let's put notch filters at the receivers at the interfering frequencies and get rid of this interference. And it worked because of this very wide signal bandwidth without causing a lot of signal distortion. So 1980s, we see this kind of work, but it is really in past 10 to 12 years that we have seen a lot of activities uh, going on in joint radar communication. So the question is, what has fundamentally changed in last few years uh, that joint radar communications is uh, uh, now studied uh, 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 a lot among um, various research communities. So for that, there are several drivers, but I'm going to focus on two major uh, factors which are driving this research these days. The first motivation comes from the trends in wireless communications industry. As you can see from this graphic that I've taken from some industry sources, the number of devices that are connected today, it's in tens of billions. And this is only going to dramatically rise in near future. We have concepts of like internet of things and so on. More devices connected means more data being exchanged. You need very high data rates to support that kind of framework. Apart from this, we have expectations from future wireless communications networks like 5G, beyond 5G or 6G, et cetera, uh, that they should offer very high quality of service and must support futuristic uh, applications related to infotainment, gaming, and wireless communications, all of which, again, require very high data rates. It turns out current traditional wireless communications regime, which is at sub-6 gigahertz, those kind of systems are unable to sustain these extremely high data rates. So in order to... Uh, support high data rates, what do we do? For that, we turn to Shannon's famous capacity formula as a guide, which tells us that the capacity C, which dictates the data rate, is governed by three factors. First is the lowercase n, which is the number of uh, non-interfering or orthogonal resources, could be number of time slots, could be number of subcarriers, for example, in OFDM, could be the number of transmit and receive antennas, for example, in MIMO communications, you increase N, it has a bearing on capacity. Second factor is signal to interference plus noise ratio or SINR, but you will have to increase SINR a lot to see any appreciable increase in C because they have a logarithmic relationship with each other. So we come to the third factor, which is bandwidth W, wider the bandwidth, uh, higher will be the capacity. However, we cannot allocate bandwidth arbitrarily or exclusively to just one application because it is a scarce natural resource. Spectrum is limited. And a lot of it, especially in the sub-6 gigahertz range, has already been allocated for other services or some existing emitters in radar or communications by international and national regulatory bodies. For example, International Telecommunications Union or ITU or Federal Communications Commission in the US, that is FCC. As you can see from this graphic uh, on the bottom left, uh, which I've taken from Ericsson's white paper published in 2022, Currently, we are at the traditional communications regime is sub-6 gigahertz. And one of the solutions, if we want to allocate more bandwidth, is so sub-6 gigahertz is already occupied, let's move up in the spectrum. Let's go to millimeter wave or the so-called sub-terahertz band, which is also called upper millimeter wave, where depending on which country you are in, you can have anywhere from 4 to 15 gigahertz of contiguous bandwidth available. That's a lot of bandwidth. In sub-6 gigahertz, carrier frequency itself is 6 gigahertz. Here we are talking about bandwidth that goes from 4 to 15 gigahertz. So we can move to those bands and uh, that can address this data rate problem. However, everyone wants to move to these bands. 
There are so many industry players nowadays, as you can see from some of these head headlines that I've taken right from 1980s to until very recently, this contest for more bandwidth, that is also not new. Wireless service providers have been asking government to allocate them more bandwidth uh, for decades so that they can offer higher quality of service, new applications, and so on. But as I mentioned earlier, because bandwidth is limited, it cannot be allocated to just one of the industry players. It must be shared, and it must be shared with other applications too, such as radar, which also would like to operate uh, with wider bandwidth for reasons that will become apparent in a moment. So the second motivation is from comes from the radar industry. Now, radar systems have been operating all across the spectrum for decades, right? From UHF, VHF band until terahertz band, we have had radar applications for a while. Terahertz communications may be new, but terahertz radars have almost 30 years uh, or almost three decades of uh, research work now. However, we have now have some new radar applications so the motivation for this joint radar communications uh, from the radar industry originates primarily for vehicular applications. As you can see from this graphic, uh, modern autonomous vehicles, they are highly sensor driven. They are equipped with different types of sensors, GPS, LIDAR, radar, ultrasonic sensors, camera, and so on. And the goal of these sensors is not just to guide the driver in a crowded or challenging traffic environment, but also to monitor the general health of the car. So we have sensors that monitor air conditioning or tire pressure sensors and so on, various, uh, various functionalities of the vehicle. And sometimes also to monitor the physiological behavior of the driver as well as other occupants of the vehicle. So we have in-cabin sensors that can measure the vital signs of the passengers or driver, like their heart rate or respiratory rate and so on. So it's a very highly sensor-driven industry, but if we focus on just the aut uh, autonomy-enabling sensors, then chiefly three of them are very common. First is, a high resolution camera, which offers a very good visual of the surroundings, has a lot of information embedded uh, in its uh, uh, video files. Uh, but the disadvantage there is whenever the visibility conditions are poorer, whether in the night or in the presence of uh, harsh weather, rain, snow, etc., then it has a poorer performance. Now, we want these sensors uh, uh, to drive the autonomy. Now, it, on the road, it's a life or death situation. We want very accurate measurements. However, a camera, uh, especially when it wants to measure the Doppler velocity of other vehicles on the road, then it uh, does not make a direct measurement. Rather, it infers the velocity indirectly by looking at the movement of the vehicle across different frames. It's not an accurate measurement. Because of these reasons, we move to remote sensing-based sensors such as LiDAR or radar. LiDAR operates in the optical range where extremely wide bandwidth is available, a lot of bandwidth. People who may be familiar with radar signal processing may recall, wider the transmit signal bandwidth, higher is your range resolution. Uh, by resolution here, we mean the ability to discriminate to very closely spaced targets. So very high re resolution is possible with LiDAR. It's the disadvantages of LiDAR are A, uh, it has, uh, its cost is very high. It's very expensive sensor. A few years ago, General Motors released a white paper where they stipulated that the cost of uh, remote sensing sensors on an autonomous vehicle in batch production should not exceed $100. And LiDAR does not meet that benchmark. Second factor is it is often mounted outside the main body of the vehicle for aesthetic reasons. Some vendors uh, uh, do not prefer that. And the third aspect is it has a mechanical scanning system, unlike a radar which has electronic scanning. So because of these reasons, uh, uh, LiDAR is not highly preferred, even though its resolution is very high. At this point, I should also mention that uh, I have seen a lot of PhD theses recently on electronically scanning LiDAR, but it, that technology is yet to enter commercial domain. So we come to radar, which is a low cost, all weather sensor day or night, uh, it's, you can still get radar measurements. And at least uh, until the range that we want to see at millimeter wave for automotive radar, even in the presence of rain, you can have measurements with the millimeter wave radar. 
And we know that it operates on Doppler principle. So it measures Doppler velocity directly. Uh, so for people who may not be familiar with how this works, uh, usually in a radar, uh, uh, it, uh, the transmitter sends out an electromagnetic wave. The wave is characterized by its amplitude, frequency, and polarization. When that wave interacts with the target of interest, all these three parameters change. When it comes back to the receiver by monitoring the change in these parameters, we can extract a wealth of information about the target. So if we measure just the delay time, the time it takes from the transmitter to target to receiver, that time is directly proportional to the range of the target with respect to the receiver. Change in the modulation frequency that is directly proportional to the radial or Doppler velocity of the target and so on. So it, may, it does these measurements directly and also it's a low cost sensor. The problem is that radar operates in the microwave range, not in the optical range. In microwave range, spectrum, the bandwidth is limited. Limited bandwidth means poor resolution. So the only way we can increase this uh, resolution is we allocate more bandwidth to radar. But as we have seen, bandwidth is limited. Uh, what is a typical stability of these radars? Uh, it's usually 77 to 81 gigahertz at millimeter wave. I have a question. Um, you said that radar is low cost. What is roughly the cost of the radar used on a car? So uh, in batch production, it should be less than $100. But yes. suppose you want to buy uh, just one radar for educational purposes and one LIDAR. So the LIDAR cost starts from 12 grands. Yeah. Radar you can get in for $50, one mm -hmm. of the kids. So, yeah. Thank you. What's the power density you need in the radar? If you're worried about the appearance of communication, presumably the automotive radar with a very short range. Yeah. Um, they have high gain antennas or are they broad? Yes. Yeah, it's it's a very narrow band, uh, bandwidth. So is the, uh, is the question is, can it really interfere with communications? Well, I guess that, that there was a difference which we talked about earlier in the Oh, we, we are coming to the- The trade sources cause problems. Uh, right, so, well, right now uh, we are at the motivation stage. So I'm, I'm only explaining which are the two primary industries which are driving this. But when we come to the automotive scenario, Usually we want just one sensor to do both jobs, communication as well as radar. Uh, and that is a system that I'm going to describe in the third segment of this talk. Yeah. Right. So, so the same, same antenna, the same electronics can communicate data? Yes. To whom will it communicate? Uh, that example is coming up. <laughs> but great question, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I'm deferring that discussion to that segment because I know I'm going to cover it. <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, any other questions? Okay. So, apart from uh, that factor about the resolution versus bandwidth, uh, all these uh, we have this concept of connected and automated vehicles, where the vehicles are supposed to talk with each other, intervehicular communication, talk with infrastructure, B two X, or to satellite, and so on. And if all of this information exchange is going to uh, be enabled, uh, then we know from our previous discussion uh, on wireless communication strength, these cards are going to generate a lot of data, which the current sub-6 gigahertz protocols like uh, CB2X or DSRC, they are unable to sustain those kind of data rates. So if you want to sustain high data rates, again, you need more bandwidth. So in autonomous vehicle scenario, <laughs> Higher bandwidth, wider bandwidth is needed for uh, uh, two reasons. Uh, first is if they want to sense accurately to have higher resolution and second to stay connected. Again, all of this requires a lot of bandwidth, which we don't have. Uh, one other question. Um, the return signal detection, is it heterodyne or monodyne? Uh, by heterodyne, you mean the FMCW kind of, right? Well, then you are mixing it. It's really making the appearance of return and the source, such that any negative instability automatically goes away, and you have a more accurate uh, measurement of, let's say, the speed or the distance. 
So normally in automotive radar, it's an FMCW based uh, receiver where uh, you do mix the incoming signal with the transmit signal and the difference between the frequency, the bead frequency, that can be used to uh, extract parameters of the target. The difference between the and the source. Yeah, FMCW radar. Yeah, so that is for auto. That's the most popular and inexpensive uh, uh, type of automotive radar. So there are reasons we may not like to use FMCW in general, because if you take normal radars, they are largely pulsed off the radars. They are not FMCW, but automotive radar industry loves FMCW. The reason being A, because it sweeps across a very wide bandwidth. So wide bandwidth is high resolution. And second is that cost factor. If you have that kind of receiver, then compared to a pulse compression receiver, the cost comes down a lot. So FMCW is a low cost, but high resolution radar. And that's why it is preferred in automotive scenarios. Yes. I have a question. Going back to the radar, uh, Walking in the middle of the street versus a big rock in the middle of the street, you would just say, unless you have a camera. But in this study, you would just have your own describing how that can take care of the outcome. So, uh, uh, a rock in the middle of the street versus? And the blue. Just see the shape, but you don't have to wait for the danger that you are approaching. And so, I'll just say, how do you? A balloon? Okay, yeah, well, yeah, but uh, for LIDAR, no, but from for radar, you can use uh, target classification radar. Yeah. yeah, so because in radar, the reflectivity will be different for. But I must say that no one is going to rely on just one sensor in these cases. Mostly uh, people prefer to do sensor fusion because they are good things with camera, they are good things with radar, LIDAR. In any case, LIDAR people want to get rid of it because of that cost factor. Uh, usually camera, radar, fusion is uh, where we are going nowadays. Uh, the most popular uh, autonomous vehicle, uh, especially in California, uh, we know the famous company, actually doesn't use radar, still only uses camera. But uh, I, I remember the CEO had announced some plans that they do have a radar unit uh, in the company, but uh, they are not using it so far. So uh, it's only camera based, but people do want to go to radar, but there is this resolution issue that must be addressed first. So that's why there's a trend for low terahertz automotive radar. So instead of 77 to 81 gigahertz, you move to 120 to 300 gigahertz, where you can have 15 gigahertz of bandwidth, and that is near optical resolution. But again, I am yet to see commercial implementations of that. Most of the work is in the research domain. I have seen some implementations by some bespoke radars uh, at low terahertz band by some university groups. The results are very good, near optical, as I said. Uh, but it is yet to enter the commercial domain. Yeah. Most of all, the covers Okay. 
Okay. So where we were, yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, so we uh, we have these two primary motivations from communications industry and automotive radar industry. Now, if we look into the spectrum allocation uh, as of now, as you can see from this table, pretty much every IEEE radar band today has some adjacent or coexisting communication service. And this problem is only becoming worse as we have uh, new players entering the market and new applications of communications, wireless communications coming up and new types of radar deployments going on or additional deployments of radar going on. So we will have this interference problem, uh, uh, which will be significantly worse in the future if we don't take care of uh, it right now. Now, this does not only have engineering or research or technical issues. There are a lot of policy, regulation, and legal issues uh, involved as well. So there have been two very famous court cases recently. I put some headlines here. So in 2021, FCC allocated slivers of sub-6 gigahertz band, which is already very crowded, to unlicensed users. That is, anyone could transmit during those very small parts of the spectrum in sub-6 gigahertz. And then AT&T sued FCC with a contention that this is going to uh, uh, affect the quality of service they provide to their users in the adjacent bands, if so many users are going to transmit in this unlicensed band. Second court case was in 2022 when uh, 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 so this, this example also demonstrates that the problem is not just limited to radar and communications. It actually extends to other types of devices as well, which are making use of the spectrum. So in 2022, uh, Federal Aviation Authority, FAA, asked Verizon, which is another wireless communication service in the U.S., uh, to stop transmitting their 5G frequencies around the airports because it was interfering with this one device that uh, airlines have been using for decades, C-band altimeter, for which helps in landing and takeoff. And they arrived at this compromise that uh, uh, the altimeter will now be fitted with uh, filters, those notch filters at the receiver, a very simple way to address this. So the problem is not just limited to radar communications, it goes to other applications too. A few other examples are radio astronomers have been complaining about interference from satellites which are affecting clean sky observations through their telescopes. Meteorologists have also seen issues where interference from Wi-Fi has been misconstrued as a false uh, storm warning uh, while it was just a normal uh, Wi-Fi interference. So this problem is... Uh, uh, across many different domains and becoming really worse. A uh, lot of other industry segments are affected. So recognizing all these issues, uh, about 12 years ago, DARPA launched uh, this program called SSPARC, that is to develop spectrum sharing technologies between S-band military radars and S-band military communications. And following the success of that uh, program, National Science Foundation started uh, expanding uh, these investigations about interference and spectrum sharing technologies across all other bands. And they have launched several programs, some of which are still continuing. I've listed some of them here, uh, SWIFT, NERDS, PAR, Spectrum X, and so on. In fact, every few months I see a new call from NSF on some issue related with spectral crowding or uh, spectral interference. So if we look into, let's say, uh, since the la launch of SSPAR program, what kind of solutions have been developed to address this problem? So I'll ignore all those solar flares and open radar uh, kind of solutions because they were very simple, just put a notch filter. Uh, but uh, since the launch of uh, SPAR, there have been a little bit more sophistication in solutions. So if I had to very, very broadly classify spectrum sharing, because if radar and communications are causing interference to each other, one way could be that let's use a common transmitter and common receiver and probably the same waveform. Uh, and then there will not be interference on each side. Of course, you'll have to work on what kind of waveforms to transmit and what should be the receive processing uh, algorithms. But based on just this very broad classification, uh, uh, here are some of the design topologies for Isaac. So this figure is from our very popular paper that appeared in IEEE Signal Processing Magazine a few years ago, where, where based on whether the transmitter and receiver are shared between radar and communications, you get 
these four types of designs. Figure A is the case when the hardware is not shared at all, either at the transmitter or at the receiver. So radar and communications, they transmit independent of each other. There's no coordination between them. Obviously, at the receiver, there's going to be a lot of interference. So in this design, which we call as spectral coexistence design, most of the innovation is on the receiver side, where we develop new receiver signal processing algorithms to mitigate the mutual interference. This kind of approach was very popular during the early days of spectrum sharing research. Uh, and it is very good for legacy systems, which have already been deployed and it will cost a lot to start changing the hardware completely. So we focus on the digital side at the receiver and try to come up with some new type of uh, 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 algorithms for interference mitigation. Everything else where some hardware is shared is called spectral co-design. Sometimes it may, they may also be transmitting a common waveform. A very general version of this is figure D, which I have taken for, uh, which I, where I'm giving an example for a vehicular scenario. So here, this is spectral co-design. Uh, there's a red car, which has the common transmitter. It is transmitting a radar waveform that is modulated with communication symbols. That waveform then interact with other cars in the environment, which we'll call them as radar targets for this part of the talk. That is the blue car and the yellow car. When that signal is reflected by these targets, it is intercepted by a common receiver, which is the gray car. The goal of signal processing at this common receiver is A, to extract the parameters of the radar targets, that is the location, Doppler velocity, or any other information it can get uh, about the blue and the yellow car, as well as B, that is to decode uh, the message that was sent by the red car. So it is functioning as the receiver for both radar as well as communications. Since here the transmitter and receiver, they are on two separate cars, we call this a bi-static uh, design. So if they were on the same car, then it will be monostatic. In a vehicular scenario, it is more common to study bi-static or if you have multiple receivers and transmitters, multi-static cases, because it is more general. If you're transmitting a waveform in a crowded traffic environment, and if it is reflected from one of the cars, very likely it can be intercepted by some other receiver as well. We'll see there are other advantages of considering this configuration uh, for uh, spectral co-design in a moment. Now, these, as I mentioned earlier, these four uh, the, uh, are, it's a very, very broad classification because if we give 12 years since the launch of Spark and there are only these four types of uh, uh, topologies, then uh, people would have uh, come up with solutions for all, all four of them. In 2015, when we started this research, there used to be one paper on Isaac uh, every six months. Today on Google Scholar Alerts, I get uh, 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 notifications about new papers every day on Isaac. So why there is so much activity now uh, uh, if there are just four of these classifications? Because this is a very broad classification. We can classify these systems in multiple ways. So we already saw based on hardware, what kind of classification is there. Now based on waveform, you can have separate waveforms for both of them, even though it's a common hardware, or it could be a common waveform that you can design, or it could be the same waveform, but it is shared on time slot basis between radar and communications. Based on the location of transmitter and receiver, we already saw bi-static case, and before that co-located case, you can extend it to multi-static, it could be networked with or without fusion center, and. So on. So, so many configurations are possible based on the locations of radar and communications nodes. Based on performance and functionality, we get sometimes different design. In joint radar communications, obviously our goal is, uh, what? is that a fire alarm? It's a silver alert, <laughs> not a fire alarm for the online audience. <laughs> okay, well, clearly not in this room, so <laughs> that's good. <laughs> All right, so, well, in a joint radar communication system, uh, obviously we want to develop a system which is optimized for both functionalities, radar as well as communications, but there could be some situations 
where our primary objective is to optimize one system, say radar, while accepting some deterioration in the performance of communications. Those solutions are called radar-centric. Vice versa, you will also have communication-centric solutions. And then there's this very interesting version, which is called opportunistic Isaac, where you want to take advantage of existing infrastructure of one of the systems, let's say communications-based stations, and with without any change in the hardware, you want to double it as a radar receiver as well. And that could be done for radar, which is doubling up as a communications transmitter. So this is opportunistic Isaac. We'll see a very interesting example toward the end of this talk on opportunistic Isaac. And then there are so many other specialized versions based on what technique you are using at the receiver. Uh, then we have joint MIMO radar, MIMO communications. If both radar and communications are multi-antenna, that is MRMC. Um, there is also this trend of using intelligent surfaces for Isaac. So typically I do a separate talk on just IRS aided Isaac. Today I won't be able to cover it, but it has developed into a field of its own nowadays. Uh, depending on which part of the spectrum uh, you are implementing the solution, usually uh, you get a different design. So for millimeter wave, uh, we'll cover one example today. Uh, for terahertz, uh, uh, because it's again extremely wide bandwidth, there's a lot of wideband processing that is needed at the receiver. There is also work from the visible light community on joint visible light communication and visible light positioning. And so I've seen some papers from quantum communities as well on joint quantum sensing quantum communications. In fact, there are about 15 different IEEE societies that have published literature on Isaac or have some task group or working group which is focused on Isaac. Even non IEEE societies like American Geophysical Union, American Meteorological Society, and International Union of Radio Science, RC, they all have task groups related to this spectral interference problem. So the problem is pervasive, and that's why there is a lot of research going on. And it's not very surprising why we have so many different types of designs, because there is so much diversity in applications of both radar and communications. We have many different types of radar. We have many different types of communications protocols. And when you want to do spectrum sharing between any two of them, it usually leads to a new bespoke solution. That's why we see so much literature coming out in this area, because uh, if you just take those two systems standalone, there's a lot of literature on just those two systems as well. Okay, so with that as the background history and where we are today and what kind of uh, solutions that people are working on, I would now pick one example each of the main uh, types of these topologies. So spectral coexistence, uh, uh, we'll take an example of dual blind deconvolution. So I had mentioned earlier spectral coexistence was very popular during the early days of spectrum sharing. That is not to say it is an easier problem to solve. This example would show that it is actually, there are some versions of spectral coexistence that are very difficult to tackle. Uh, then we'll look into uh, spectral co-design uh, on automotive Isaac, which would answer your question on this common transmitter, common receiver in much more detail. And then I'll close it with uh, opportunistic Isaac example. And as I mentioned earlier, as we go from coexistence to opportunistic Isaac, we'll go from a very theoretical example to a very practical example. So let's start with this uh, spectral coexistence case where I'm going to, uh, I picked up this problem of dual line deconvolution as an example uh, that we have been working uh, at Army Research Lab for past three years. So to understand what dual line deconvolution is, first let's focus on how normal radar and communications operate. In a conventional radar system, we transmit the waveform. So we know what waveform it is. That waveform then interacts with the target profile, which we would call radar channel for this segment of the talk. The received signal is the convolution of the transmit signal with the radar channel. Since we know the transmit waveform, with that knowledge, we then try to estimate the unknown radar channel or unknown target information. This is the classical deconvolution problem, which was described by Norbert Wiener himself in 1940s. Now consider a case where someone else is transmitting the waveform. It could be a case of passive radar or could be a hostile entity that is transmitting the waveform. In that case, we don't know what waveform it is. Then at the receiver, you have this convolution product of unknown transmit waveform and unknown radar channel. And just by looking at the received measurements, that convolution product, you would like to estimate both of these unknown quantities. This problem is called blind convolution. So there's been a 
rich heritage of research on blind deconvolution in signal processing literature right from 1970s. In past 10 years, there has been a lot more work in that area where people have tried to exploit advances in sparse reconstruction technologies to guarantee perfect reconstruction in blind deconvolution. In com communications also, you may have a similar problem. In communications, it's usually the transmit message that is unknown and the channel we estimated a priori. Then with the knowledge of the estimated channel, we try to estimate that unknown transmit message in this convolution product. But in vehicular communications, where the channel is highly dynamic, even if you estimate it a priori, that uh, that estimate may become outdated very quickly. This is also the problem as you move up in the spectrum to millimeter wave or terahertz, where the coherence times of the channels are very short. The channel decorrelates very quickly. So you will have a situation at the receiver where you do not know the channel. You also don't know your transmit message. That is blind deconvolution. And this is what radar and communication separately recall spectral coexistence where both of these signals are overlaid or superimposed on each other. That would be the problem of dual blind deconvolution. So that's what this first equation here tells us where yt is our measurement of spectral coexistence receiver and the two convolution products are superimposed on it. So x uh, in, uh, denotes the uh, transmit signal, h denotes the channel, uh, and then ray, uh, the subscript r and c, uh, they denote, they stand for the radar and communications respectively. So you look at y and all those four convolvents are unknown by just looking at measurements, how can we estimate all four of these? So in general, it is not possible because there are so many combinations of these four that would map to the same y. So how can we uniquely extract it? So in other words, this is an ill-posed problem. If we look into the blind deconvolution literature, the single blind deconvolution literature, normally these problems can be tackled if we have some information about the structure of those signals. So if, if you know a little bit more, you may not know the exact uh, value of X or H, but if you have some knowledge about the structure, that can help in solving this problem. So that's how we proceed. We start with what are the most common models for uh, these channels and signals. So for radar channel, that is the gray box, we assume there are L targets. Each target is characterized by three unknowns, unknown reflectivity alpha, which indicates the size, shape, or material of the object. Uh, delay time tau, which as I mentioned earlier, is directly proportional to the location of the target with respect to the receiver. And then Doppler frequency nu r, which is directly proportional to the radial or Doppler velocity of the target. So there's a very common radar channel model. For communications channel, again, we uh, assume a similar delay Doppler channel model with Q paths. For the transmit signal, in case of radar, we assume it is a pulse Doppler radar. That is, it is transmitting a train of pulses at regular uh, intervals, uh, that is P pulses, but we don't know the signal S. S is unknown, the transmit signal is unknown. There may be a case where you do not know the frequency as well because it's blind deconvolution. So we don't have enough information. So uh, before, if you, if you don't know the periodicity of the signal, you may first want to estimate the periodicity using period estimation algorithms. In this work, we'll ignore that part. We'll assume that has already been done. So we start with a known period. So S is a known. And for communication signal, we assume the standard or conventional OFDM signal where the message GP is a known. Note that our objective here is only to estimate the message GP. We are not decoding it. If in addition, you also want to decode it, then since 1990s, there have been a lot of work on um, blind decoding and blind equalization, those algorithms can be put to use once you have estimated GP. So we'll stop at estimating GP in this problem. All right, so I have this structure. I take these structures, put it in the first equation. It is continuous time, so I discretize it. And then after a few pages of tedious algebra, whose details you can find in our paper that appeared last year in IEEE journal on selected uh, areas in, in information theory, JSAIT, uh, after those derivations, we get this last equation here. So this is this equation now takes care of the structure. Measurements Y, the discrete measurements Y, and there are so many unknowns. All the channel parameters are unknown and all the transmit signals are unknown. We would like to estimate them. So we still don't have an algorithm on how to estimate this. This is just a model which takes care of the structure. So 
in, in order to find out the algorithm, we first make the following observations. The channel parameters, they are continuous valued. So by this, what I mean is, uh, let's take the Doppler velocity. So if you have a fighter aircraft and it is uh, it does not fly at uh, uh, speeds such as 300 meter per second and after that it only goes to 310 meter per second or 320, it's a continuous value parameter. It can have any value, 303.56, 312.19, etc. It's a continuous valued parameter. However, in standard radar signal processing, when we want to estimate Doppler velocity, the approach is to take the DFT of the spectrum. And DFT requires binning, that is discretization of the spectrum. And if the bin size is 10 meter per second, even if the aircraft is flying at a speed of 305 meter per second, you can only estimate it, it as either 300 meter per second or 310 meter per second. So it's a continuous value parameter. We don't want to do this discretization. So those kind of standard algorithms, they go out of the window. We'll have to think of something else. Second observation is that the channels are sparse. We have only L targets or Q paths compared to the total number of samples or the region that radar is scanning or communications is sampling. So compared to the total number of range bins and total number of pulses that the receiver admits, compared to that L and Q, they are very small. It's a sparse channel scenario, which is true for most of these applications. Third one is, which is related to transmit signals. So again, in most of these applications, uh, uh, it is fairly common to assume flat spectral response for the uh, uh, transmit signals. In other words, we can make this mild restriction that the transmit signals, they lie in a low dimensional subspace. This is the famous so-called lifting trick, which is very popular for ill post problems like phase retrieval, blind deconvolution, and so on. The importance of this lifting trick is if you recall, we want to solve this problem where I have on the left-hand side, the measurements Y, right-hand side, I have all these unknowns. I have way more variables, unknown variables than the number of measurements. What this lifting trick will do, it will translate solving that problem to the retrieval of a low rank matrix uh, from, from a system of equations. And those low rank matrices, they would encapsulate all the unknowns that we want to estimate. Once we estimate those matrices, we can get these unknowns. So it uh, kind of simplifies uh, how you're going to retrieve the unknowns. So after we take care of all of this, then again, after a few pages of complex algebra, we get this compact signal model, which you see in, under the linear sensing model, the first equation, that is the discrete measurements Y, their superposition of two linear operators, Alif R and Alif C, for radar and communications respectively, each of which uh, is a function of a rank one matrix, Z, R, and C, C, which contain all the unknowns for radar and communications respectively. Our goal is to retrieve these. Now, before we move forward on how we solve this problem, I want to attract your attention on the structure of ZR and ZC. As you can see from these last equations, they contain complex exponentials. We know from Euler's formula, we can write a complex exponential in terms of sines and cosines. In other words, we are dealing with a trigonometric polynomial. We'll use this term a little bit more frequently in this segment of the talk, but uh, that is not very intimidating because we work with trigonometric polynomials all the time in signal processing. DFT has complex exponentials where we are working with trigonometric polynomial already. It's just that in electrical engineering, we don't use that term on day-to-day -day basis. But that is what we are working with. And this is going to come in handy when we are going to solve this problem. So how do we solve this problem? We'll take advantage of sparsity. Normally, in a sparse reconstruction scenario, the first line of attack is you do L1 norm minimization. However, in this case, the sparsity is not very simple because A, you have sparsity in two domains, in the range domain as well as in the frequency or Doppler domain. So it's a bivariate uh, structure of sparsity. Second, uh, you have superposition of two different sparse signals, one for radar, one for communications. So it's not straightforward to apply the conventional uh, sparse reconstruction algorithm in this case. So what we are going to do, we are going to use a generalization of L1 norm, that is atomic norm, which was proposed about 12 years ago. It's an analog of L1 norm on arbitrary basis. So it can take care of more complex versions of sparse 
sparsities. And prior works have shown that atomic norm minimization is very good in retrieval of continuous value parameter, which was also one of our uh, uh, constraints. All right, so that's what we are going to do. We'll do atomic norm minimization compared to standard atomic norm minimization, where once you write the atomic norm minimization problem, you get a semi-definite program in a very straightforward me method. The importance of having semi-definite program or SDP is that then you can go to a computer and you can write a code to solve that problem. So our goal will be to find out that this SDP, but it is not straightforward in our case because A, the same thing by the sparsity, uh, uh, we could not extend it in a straightforward uh, manner. So here uh, we are not going to minimize just one atomic norm, rather the sum of two atomic norms because sum of two norms is also a convex function. So one for radar, one for communications. And these atomic norms, they are higher dimensional atomic norms because they are bivariate. So that's the problem you see in this box where I'm minimizing the sum of multivariate atomic norms, two atomic norms subjected to the equality constraints, which are the measurements. All right, so now we have this Primal optimization problem, I still don't have a SDP. My goal is to find out an SDP. So how do I proceed? This is not very tractable. From optimization theory, we know uh, sometimes if primal is not tractable, it's dual. If you have just equality constraints in the primal problem, then again, from optimization theory, Slater's condition holds and you have strong duality. What that means is, if you have the solution of the dual problem, that gives the exact solution of the primal problems. So you don't have to worry about, oh, I'm solving a different version of the problem. How will I get the solution to this? So from here on, we can just focus on the dual problem. The question is, how do we find out the SDB in the dual problem? That's where this positive trigonometric polynomial theory comes into play. So for people who may not be familiar with this, I have a very quick one slide version on which result we are going to use from trigonometric polynomial theory. As I mentioned again, we use them all the time in signal processing. We just don't call them trigonometric polynomials. They are the complex exponentials which occur in FFT, DFT, and so on. In 2007, Professor Bogdan Dumitrescu from Tempere University wrote this beautiful book, Positive Trigonometric Polynomials and Their Signal Processing Applications. And now there is a second edition also that is out. So we are going to use this result from that particular theory. What it say, tells us, if we, I have a trigonometric polynomial Rz, where Z is a complex exponential, and I can write it as the summation of those polynomial coefficients Rk in the, in the Z basis. If it is non-negative on unit circle, you can again think of a DFT in this case, then I can describe it by this parameterization, where I have the polynomial coefficients are k, which is the trace of the product of these two matrices, theta k and q. So I can, in fact, use a positive semidefinite matrix q to actually completely describe this polynomial. What is the importance of this result? If I have an inequality related to trigonometric polynomial, for example, trigonometric polynomial greater than or equal to zero, that is, it is a positive trigonometric polynomial, I can actually use a matrix inequality to describe it, in particular, a linear matrix inequality or LMI, and we'll see very quickly how we use this particular result. Just a minor point of detail, so this is for just one dimension, but we are dealing with higher dimensions. So we have positive hyper octane trigonometric polynomial. That's a matter of detail. How do we use it? Here is how we use it. So recall, we had the primal optimization problem and we wanted to look into uh, its dual. So take the Lagrange and then derive the dual. You get the first equation. Primal was minimized and the dual is then the maximize. Primal had equality constraints. And in the dual, you have the inequality constraint. So let's focus on the first inequality where I have a dual of atomic norms smaller than or equal to one. I take that atomic norm on the uh, right-hand side. Then I have one minus a, a dual of atomic norm greater than or equal to zero. You expand it, it turns out it's a positive trigonometric polynomial inequality. So we use the result for Dum from Dumitrescu and replace those inequalities with the linear matrix uh, inequalities, which are shown in the second equation. Once you write this up, that is the SDP. That is the semi-definite program. Now you can go to a computer and use your favorite optimization software, CBX or whichever, and you can code this up. 
So we can solve this problem, but where are the channel parameters? That is the next question. So here is how you get the channel parameters. When you solve this problem, the output is going to be two polynomials, one for radar, that is FR, another one for communications, that is FC. Here is how you can get the channel parameters out. That is encapsulated in this theorem, but I'll explain it what this means. You take these two polynomials, they are function of delay and Doppler. You plot them in a delay Doppler plane, they are absolute value. Wherever the value is unity, that is the location of your target. You can compare this with the standard detection theory in radar signal processing. After processing the whole signal, normally we compare the post-process signal with certain threshold. If the strength of the signal is above the threshold, you declare it is a target. If it is below that, then it is noise or clutter. Here, the threshold is not any threshold, rather than it is actually unity within some numerical precision. To show how this works, here is an example. So we got those two polynomials, FR and FC. We plot them in delay Doppler planes. And then we are looking for the peaks of this particular polynomial. So I've expanded some of the high peak regions here. And the green circle denotes the location of true targets in a delay Doppler plane or channel parameters. And the plus sign is when I see a unity value, I mark it as plus. It turns out this plus is right on top of that green circle. Once you have retrieved channel parameters here, you take this and put this in your dual blind deconvolution equation. Now it is no longer blind because you know two convolvins. You have to only find the transmit signals for which you can use any one of your favorite tools, for example, least squares method, and you can retrieve the uh, transmit signals for radar and communications. So this example was intended to show how new, complex, and interesting signal processing theories, they come into play in Isaac problems. Of course, there are several other versions of this problem. What happens when it is n-tuple blind deconvolution? That is not just two convolutions, but multiple or what happens when you use uh, multiple antennas at the receiver, then you have to retrieve the direction of arrival as well. What happens in the presence of noise and so on. So all those cases, I'm not going to cover them, but I provided some references here from our papers where we uh, actually explore many other generalizations of dual blind deconvolution. Now we look into a co-design problem. And as I mentioned earlier, now we are moving more into uh, some practical issues here. So here the example is from automotive joint radar communications. We'll stick with that bi-static scenario that I had shown you earlier. Uh, and I had mentioned that it is a more general scenario to use, but there are some other advantages also. For example, if the transmitter and receiver, they are on the same car, then the coverage of the radar is that red circle that you see on the bottom right, because it is equal in all directions. But in a biostatic scenario, where the transmitter and receiver, they are on different cars, then you get range enhancement in one direction, because now the coverage is an ellipse, and the range enhancement is along the uh, semi-major axis of the ellipse. So you can get range enhancement, and the transmitter and receiver, they don't even have to be in line of sight. So they can do some kind of non-line of sight sensing also, because as you can see from the diagram on my static case, there is this another blue car between the red and the gray car. So the transmitter and receiver, they don't directly see each other, but they're still able to get information about the blue and the yellow. So that's why bi-static or multi-static scenarios, they can help in range enhancement. They can also, uh, they do also do not require transmitter receiver to be in direct line of sight. So that is another advantage. Now, in this world, because this is co-design, recall in coexistence, we only work at the receiver. In co-design, you work at both receiver as well as transmitter. So in this work, we started with the transmitter and our objective was, which is the best waveform to transmit for joint radar communications in this scenario? So this is from our paper that appeared in Transactions on Aerospace and Electronic Systems, and it was the runner-up for the IEEE Barry Carlton Award last year. So we start with the waveform design. You can design a completely new waveform that is good for both radar and communications, but automotive industry would not prefer that because then they may not have chipsets or hardware to support this completely new waveform. So usually they recommend using one of the existing waveforms and then modify it for the joint radar communications purposes. So building on that philosophy, we explore two waveforms. One is radar-centric, 
So if you recall radar centric communication centric uh, uh, Isaac topology. So for radar centric, we are using phase modulated continuous wave. So here, if you use FMCW radar, you cannot embed communication symbols in that. So we use another version, which is PMCW. So IMEC has chipsets on PMCW automotive radar nowadays. So we use phase modulated continuous wave and from communication side, we explore OFDMA. They have a lot of useful properties, which I have listed here, but I want to highlight the most important one, which are relevant to this discussion. PMCW has a very good performance in estimating the range. OFDMA has a very good performance in estimating the Doppler velocity. We wanted to know that if we use these in a joint radar communications mode, would they, would the new waveform have these properties or not? For that, we examine its ambiguity function. Uh, for people who may not be familiar with what ambiguity function is, so you take a transmit waveform and then you correlate it with its delayed and Doppler shifted replicas. The result is a two dimensional function in delay and Doppler plane with the central main lobe and then some side lobes. Lower the side lobes, it is better because then you can uh, distinguish two very closely spaced targets very well. So we derive those ambiguity functions. I'll skip the equations. You can find them in our paper, but here is how the performance looks like. So we look into the delay cuts and the Doppler cuts of this two-dimensional function. What it tells us that the children waveform, the JRC version of these two waveforms, they retain the properties of their parent waveforms. So PMCW JRC has a very good performance in range, just like PMCW, and OFDMA JRC does the same for Doppler estimation, just like the standalone OFDMA. Now that we have this knowledge, now we can look at the receiver. So for the receive processing, uh, it is very similar for both systems, PMCW and OFDMA. Mathematically, it is very similar, uh, except for a couple of differences. So here is the PMCW JRC processing. So there are a lot of equations. I'm not going to read all of them. I just want to highlight the most important part here. So the received signal after you model it, uh, you get that four summation signal that you see there. There are four unknowns in this signal that we want to estimate the range of the target, Doppler velocity of the target, angle of arrival, and then communication symbol. Now it is PMCW JRC. We know its performance is very good in range domain uh, for range estimation. Turns out you use a match filter in this case and you get very good estimation of range. For angle of arrival, use the standard Fourier beam forming. You can get angle of arrival as well. Now you're left with two unknowns. Doppler and communications, it turns out in the residual signal, these two parameters, they are coupled. You cannot separate them or estimate them independently. So the next part is how to break that coupling. So in our work, we suggested a type of multiplexing. Do not transmit joint radar communications waveform all the time. You transmit some pulses, which are joint radar communications, and some pulses, which are devoid of communications, radar-only waveform. If you do that, it gives you enough identifiability at the receiver to break the coupling. So you can estimate the coupled parameter very well. So in this case, the coupled parameter is Doppler. Range, uh, because PMCW estimates it very well, PMCW JRC does the same. If you look into OFDMA JRC, you have a similar problem, except the coupled parameter is different. Recall OFDMA estimates Doppler velocity very well. So here it is the range that gets coupled with communication symbols. You cannot separate it from communication symbol. Again, the solution is multiplexing, except the multiplexing here is now in frequency domain. Some subcarriers we reserve for just communications, uh, for, for just joint radar communications, and the rest of the subcarriers are devoid of communications. They are radar only. So with that multiplexing, again, you can break this coupling. In fact, the overall transmitter receiver design, if you see the receive part is exactly identical, except for which parameter gets coupled. So you have a radar processor at the receiver and communications radar processor first estimates the uncoupled parameters. Communications processor tries to decode the communications messages from this joint radar communication symbol. Obviously, because it's a mixed signal, that decoding is not going to be perfect. Anyway, it decodes it and then passes that information to the radar processor where the radar processor then removes the communication symbols and then estimates the coupled parameter. Now I'll show in a moment how multiplexing can actually help here if this communication removal is not perfect. 
As far as the transmitter is concerned, obviously these are two different waveforms. You are going to have a different way to generate those waveforms. So transmitter is different, except for the multiplexing. Multiplexing is common in both PMCW and OFDMA, but the domain in which you multiplex is different. So PMCW, it's in time domain. OFDMA, it's in the subcarrier or frequency domain. The last part of this segment that I wanted to highlight is how this multiplexing helps. So recall it was range that was coupled in OFDMA and Doppler that was coupled in PMCW. So here I'm plotting the root mean square error in the estimation of range for OFDMA and Doppler for PMCW. Red curve is the theoretically best performance. This is the case when the communication symbol removal is perfect. But obviously, in practice, that's not going to happen because communication processor is operating on this joint signal. So red is the perfect case. Blue is the case when that communication removal is imperfect and there is no multiplexing. Let's focus on figure B, where we are comparing this error with respect to SNR. At high SNR, blue merges with red. But these systems are not often high SNR systems, especially radar. It's a low SNR system. So at low SNR, the gap widens between the blue and the red curve. But if you do multiplexing, which is the gray curve, that is uh, here we are doing half multiplexing, half subcarriers or frames for radar only transmission and rest half for joint radar communications. If you do that, then it actually narrows the gap with the red curve. So multiplexing is actually essential for these kind of systems if you want to estimate both radar and communications parts in a joint signal at a common receiver. At this stage, uh, so I, I had mentioned earlier that we can also look into a few other examples of co-design, but uh, if there are questions related to that, then uh, I'll produce those slides. But I want to just go to the last part, which is actually very interesting which is the opportunistic Isaac. So now there are not going to be any equations. Now we are just going to look into a very practical example. So in opportunistic Isaac, we want to take advantage of an existing system and we want to use it for the other functionality. So here we have this example of sensing weather. So this is a project uh, I've been doing with a telecommunications company in Europe, uh, whose name I cannot divulge because of proprietary reasons, but we can discuss the research part of it. So the problem is as follows. If you want to sense weather, you use weather radars. They are usually S-band or C-S-band in the US and C-band in Europe. These are very big systems in, and very expensive also. Uh, in the contiguous United States, there are about 140 S-band radars that are operated by National Weather Service, and they theoretically cover the whole of the US. The maximum range of these radars is 250 kilometers. However, in practice, at about 80 kilometers, the lowest elevation beam of the radars is already touching the cloud tops. It is not looking at the lower troposphere, which is where all the interesting uh, activity or rain, rainfall is happening. So in practice, there are gaps in the coverage of these radars. Then there are a lot of other parts of the world, especially developing economies, where because these uh, systems are very expensive, there are no weather radars. They, they are not covered at all. However, there are, because of increased mobile usage nowadays, there are a lot of communication satellites, user terminals on the ground. So the signal in this case comes from the satellite, goes through the whole atmosphere, and then is intercepted by these user terminals. As the signal propagates through the atmosphere, it interacts with the other particles or hydrometeors, uh, uh, raindrops, et cetera, and it loses its strength. In other words, it suffers attenuation. If we can quantify that attenuation, it has to be proportional to rainfall. So the idea is, can you use this information on attenuation to estimate the rainfall? The advantage of this approach is, unlike weather radars, uh, we have these user terminals all around the world, about, uh, uh, about uh, 300,000 in Europe and 2 million worldwide. And so there's a lot of wealth of information available here. So that was the challenge. Can you estimate rainfall from this attenuation data? Now, if we look into uh, uh, the weather radar scenario, because it is built for sensing weather, 
at the receiver, you get a lot of information. You get reflectivity of the target. You get Doppler velocity of the storm. If it is dual polarimetric, you get a lot of polarimetric information as well, like size and shape of the raindrop, intensity of rainfall, and so on. And using all of these factors, you can very accurately estimate rainfall. However, in the case of user terminal, all we know is the transmit power at the satellite and the received power at the user terminal. You take the difference that tells you the attenuation. So it's very information deficient scenario. A very standard relationship at millimeter wave, so these are millimeter wavelengths, KUK bandlings, is that there is a linear relationship between the rainfall rate and the specific attenuation. Specific attenuation is the first derivative of attenuation with respect to range. But that linear relationship is no longer valid when the, the storms become convective, when there is a lot of wind and a host of other atmospheric phenomena. So we cannot use this standard linear RAH relationship that is prescribed by ITU for accurate estimation of rainfall. So since we don't have enough information, we cannot use any one of these things, so what do we do? So in all of the presentations these days, there comes a point where you encounter deep learning. This is that point in my presentation, because it is information deficient scenario, we resort to using a deep learning network in this case. Our approach is we are going to train a deep learning network with the nearest weather radar data. And then in the prediction stage, we'll use the communications link data. So that's what we do here. So here we started with this one very simple example. So you can see in the diagram, we are looking into the southwestern region of Germany, where in that rectangular box, we have about 25 to 30 uh, uh, these user terminals of communication satellite. So we train our LSTM deep learning network with the nearest German weather service radar data, that is the DWT data. And then in prediction stage, we see what the communications uh, satellite network gives us. So for just one terminal, there are two plots that I have shown here. The bottom plot is the instantaneous rain rate. So you can see the satellite link very closely follows the DWD radar in that case, but this is not what meteorologists use. They use cumulative rain rate or accumulations, which is what is shown in the top plot where you can see that as time elapses, the satellite link estimate, it's the gap widens with respect to the radar estimate. It's not very accurate. So we wanted to improve this. So how do we do that? Before that, let's look into one more result from the same region. That was, those two plots were for just one terminal. We do this for all the terminals and we generate a rainfall map. Shown here is a comparison of the rainfall map. On the right side is what a German weather service radar is seeing for a storm that is moving towards the northeast. On the left side uh, is this uh, rainfall map generated using these 25 to 30 user terminals using deep learning network. Obviously, radar is more accurate. The satellite link only covers, only shows this blob, it's uh, uh, rough direction towards the northeast, relative intensity may be same, but it is not accurate at all. Meteorologists cannot use this. The reason being uh, why we are not getting very good performance, because we are using very limited data, just 25 terminals. We know that in case of deep learning problems, the more data you provide, more accurate that prediction becomes. So those were just 25 terminals. Then we got access to the data of entire France, about 11,000 terminals. And then we also did some tweaking with our network. We used a version of convolutional neural networks and we trained them for these 11,000 terminals. Here is the result we got. The top panel is on the right side, you see the satellite link, what we, our neural network is giving us. And that is compared with the Meteo France radar data, which is on the left side. Now you can see intensities are very comparable. And uh, uh, even the general pattern of the storm is very well captured by the satellite link. The bottom two panels do the same comparison every three hours, where again, you can see it very closely tracks the storm. Here is a movie which compares this case. So on the right side, again, you have the satellite link. All the black dots that you see there, they are the user terminal locations. And many a time you see some black dots, they disappear when there is an outage. But despite the outage, uh, we can see very clearly the satellite link is capturing the circulation of the storm, general direction of the storm, and even intensity in some of the areas which may not be covered by radar and where they may, there may also be outage from the satellite link. We have done this work for 
uh, few other regions. Uh, nowadays, we are looking into Switzerland. That is more challenging because of the mountainous terrain. And we're also doing this for Brazil, where we do not have enough radar coverage. So we use a pre-trained network to actually estimate rainfall in the absence of radar. This is a very good example that shows how you can complement a weather sense, uh, you can complement a radar observations with an existing communications network. So it's a very practical example of ISAC. Now, clearly, I, I took only one example each of each of the solution topologies, but there's a lot of work going on in this area. Now, we have uh, uh, quite a bit of work in distributed ISAC or irs aided ISAC, as I mentioned earlier, including using 5G waveforms like OFDM for vital sign monitoring, like measurement of respiratory rate or uh, heart rate of drivers and passengers. So it's difficult to cover all of these in detail. Uh, again, those are sometimes separate uh, lecture topic of one hour, but I provided references here if you are interested in exploring this further. Uh, one last uh, remark that I want to make uh, is whenever you are opening up spectrum for shared use between radar and communications, then the privacy of communications users and security of military radars could be compromised. So there is a lot of focus these days on privacy preserving and secure ISAC. We also have some work on this. You can find more details in the references here. So we have come to the end of this lecture. Uh, at the end of every YouTube video, you have like, share, subscribe. Now, this is not a YouTube video, but if you're interested in uh, uh, in my research, then please feel free to follow me on my LinkedIn handle, where I regularly post updates about my papers and upcoming talks. Uh, we also had a book that was published this year by Wiley IEEE Press, Signal Processing for Joint Radar Communications, where you'll find a wealth of information beyond uh, whatever I have covered so far. Uh, by now, you might have guessed I have a lot of interest in weather radars. Uh, we had this three-volume compendium uh, that we published last year on advances in weather radar in the last 10 years, which uh, uh, which you may find a very good uh, or useful resource. So with that, I would like to thank you for coming to attend this lecture, and I'm happy to take up any questions you guys might have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Uh, for your neural network training, is that something that geography plays a role in your training data? So, I mean, in other words, could you take the data from France and apply it to Japan? Or do you have to train the Japan data for Japan? Uh, well, it would be preferred to uh, do the Japan in Japan thing, right? Uh, but, uh, for example, in case of Brazil, where we don't have nearest weather radar, there we use a pre-trained network from a similar geography and do some kind of transfer learning. So in transfer learning, if you don't have uh, a lot of training data for a new location, you uh, but the application remains the same, then you use your pre-trained network from another location, freeze the lower layers, and with the limited data you have from the new location, you update the upper layers. That can give much better performance. That is the approach we are using. Then for the uh, the convolution, uh, so I can really see that being of a lot of interest, let's in, say, in some government agencies. But do you see like is it something that's practical to actually deploy it like car level? I mean, could you imagine like cars actually running those optimization algorithms? Like, um, uh, well, not for cars because this is more like a military or security application. So oh, yeah. Well, uh, so, uh, well, uh, if we take the example of the co design case, right? Uh, right. That, that was the automotive case. Uh, uh, so, yes, and those are low complexity algorithms. There was no optimization there. If you look into that receiver processor and you have a standard radar processor, standard communications, uh, and it's only this coupling factor, right? Uh, uh, that, that comes into play there. So we suggest do the multiplexing and you could extract this. Now, has is, is someone using these algorithms now? There's a different version that is already in. So if you take IEEE 802.1180 protocol, which is the V2V communications protocol, that has been used for sensing. 
because so I didn't cover that part. But if you look into the preamble of that protocol, it has what we call as GoLi sequences, which have been uh, which have very good ambiguity function performance can be used for radar purposes. So there is more work on those kind of protocols and uh, uh, to use them, that communication protocol for radar applications. So the co-design work that I showed today, there was no optimization involved, straightforward, low complexity processing, but you still have to do that because you don't know which parameter is coupled. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions online. Uh, you guys can type online and I can read those questions. Uh, you can also unmute yourselves. Yeah, or you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Yes, sir, I have a question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned um, standards, for example, like the you know, PTX, that uh, maybe have incorporated some of this technology in the area. How about uh, mobile communications? Do you see that like 6G? Is that one of the use cases that you're talking about when you're saying applications against 6G? So uh, there is an IEEE standard in, under development for this. That is 802.11BF, uh, Wi-Fi sensing standard, use of Wi-Fi for radar. That's already under development, supposed to be a part of 6G. So. Did the common receiver, common transmitter thing answer to your question? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, I take a photograph. <laughs> That's our point of view section. Thanks for playing. Oh, okay. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, uh, everybody, for joining us online. And uh, we'll stop the recording right now. We're at 18 now. Yes, I won't tell you 22. Thank you.